Thanks very much. Um, well, we certainly got a lot of uh, questions out on the table in the first panel and also listened to some of the examples of what can be done uh, and perhaps what can't be done legally uh, using this technology. Uh, our next panel has, uh, just as the first did, an extremely wide-ranging um, set of expertises uh, who are represented on it. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a, um, a series of presentations, and I think what we're going to try and do is actually uh, hold the questions until the end, uh, because the idea here is this is like some kind of uh, layered MIDI track, you know, various layers are added in, and hopefully by the end the, uh, the whole will be much greater than the sum of the parts, although you can decide which instrument each of the panelists represents as they each present. Um, I'm going to introduce them uh, uh, individually uh, as they begin their talk. Our, our first uh, panelist is Paul Miller, a.k.a. DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid. Uh, Paul is a conceptual artist, writer, and musician working in New York City. Um, he publishes, uh, co-publishes a magazine called Gathering of the Tribes and uh, is, uh, was uh, first editor-large of the digital media magazine Art Byte. Um, He's uh, best known, as he says in his bio, under his, uh, the moniker of his constructed persona. Of course, the cultural studies people in the audience would quickly interject that all personae are constructed. This one is merely more obviously constructed than most. Um, that's uh, DJ Spooky, that's the blue little kid, a character from his upcoming novel, Flow My Blood, the DJ said. Um, we're particularly happy to have him here because uh, one of our goals, as Daphne said at the beginning of this uh, panel, was for this not simply to be uh, a set of discussions about um, uh, the question of music in which a group of lawyers stand up one after another and describe what the laws uh, are and what they uh, should be and then sit down again. On the other hand, one thing that I do want to add and one thing I think you'll see from uh, our panelists today, while each of them has a very distinct expertise in a particular area, whether it is working in the law with uh, music, whether it is music uh, being a music historian, whether it is being a performer, a conceptual artist, and so forth, they also have very strong uh, views, I think, about the other aspects of it. This is not an area, thank goodness, where everyone stays neatly confined to their own specialty. So I think you'll find that Paul has some strong views about uh, the legal and other uh, regulations that might want to surround music, and I think uh, that some of the others will express some views about the uh, impact of all of this on aesthetics. So uh, with all of that, uh, let me turn it over to Paul Miller. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, really interesting discussions earlier, uh, and it was a real pleasure to see this sort of give and take amongst all the different viewpoints. Um, can I get my laptop screen up? Uh, here's the... You should be getting signal. Okay. Um, above me, you're seeing an image taken from a series of uh, sort of war graphic design pieces from different time periods. I'm fascinated with graphic design and uh, this notion of quotation. So um, this is a sticker I've, been, I've made. And I, I, I use uh, found material all the time to make stickers and a different kind of logos and a critique of how they move through the culture. Uh, and sort of to uh, do a hands-on kind of take on things, um, I want to pass out a couple examples of sound, and then I'm going to show a movie clip. Um, considering that sound is such a, a, an important visual context for us uh, in the way we think of how uh, culture works and the way it expresses itself, um, I always like to trace things back to the record cover. And um, it's something I've been fascinated with for a while. Um, there was a, a graphic designer named Alex Steinweiss in the 30s who uh, was working at RCA Victor and a couple other places. And he was really frustrated with both the control of images and how they would work with posters and how um, they would also, um, can you hear me OK? Uh, kind of be left out when we, people thought of music. The usual artwork for record cover sleeve back then was basically a brown cover sleeve you'd see the logo of RCA Victor, the dog kind of listening to the, the phonograph kind of scene. But um, in, the, in our day and age, uh, we now have come to inherit this idea of visual music. Uh, the record cover sleeve is a kind of a, a signpost for what the sounds kind of evoke. Um, so he's considered to be the inventor of the record cover sleeve. He was the first person to really add imagery to uh, the, the sleeve and then somehow bring the notion of sound and visual material together in one context. So um, I want to pass out a couple records and a couple stickers. 
I'm going to start out with um, a gentleman named Jean-Michel Basquiat. This is one of his 12 inches. And what he did was um, basically as a painter, he would appropriate words and text from the culture around. Uh, you know, he was kind of an osmotic sponge, so to speak. And he would reconfigure the words and uh, then put them in his canvases. So uh, this is a record about versions. So um, can I hand this to somebody? Or This is uh, Marshall McLuhan's record, The Medium is the Massage. It's, um, here you go. And McLuhan um, basically recorded himself and various actors reading from the book. And then uh, where different fonts would come in, he'd have different actors uh, convey verbally the text. So it was kind of a, a spoken word rendition of the album. Um, this is John Cage's record, Cheap Imitation, which is based on a whole system of found records that he uh, sis used a certain system, what it, was, what it was called the I Ching, to make a mix out of found sound. So if you think about the American compositional tradition of Charles Ives, for example, uh, he was kind of trying to employ that as a kind of a quotation system. Um, this is Robert Rauschenberg's record um, that he did with the Talking Heads. Um, you'll see it as a kind of a, a visual collage, but you have to imagine it in motion, so to speak. So, um, and then last but... <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, la last but not least, I want to pass out um, Parliament Funkadelic. This is one of my favorite groups. Uh, this is the clones of Dr. Funkenstein. You'll see him making copies of himself in the studio. Um, so these are all kind of amusing visual metaphors for what I'm going to be talking about and this notion of uh, sound and folk culture. Um, up until the age of the recorded media, as uh, Daphne mentioned earlier, um, many historians and sort of social kind of social historians have traced the idea of the oral text and orality as a, as a key uh, sort of archive of humanity. Um, to me, as a DJ and artist, I start out mainly with the idea of dematerialization of the art object, how culture was moving at a very fast rate, uh, everything was becoming software, and, and in a certain sense, um, that left the notion of the physical sound of music uh, in a sense uh, a floating kind of immaterial and also kind of decorporalized system of, of relations. So um, I want to pass out stickers too, because this is my uh, way of always having a kind of a, a visual tag, so to speak. So the, the stickers you're getting are the exact same rendition of a, of a um, Photoshop file, which is you're seeing on my screen. Can I uh, pass these out? So, and these, there's two versions, so you can take one of each. <laughs> um, sure, one is the American flag, the other is uh, taken from the logos that were painted on the side of American bombers during World War II. So um, graphic design, ownership of intellectual property issues, um, how the, you know, the notion of imagery moves in our culture. All of these kind of issues are something that I, as an artist, was critiquing when I first started out. So before I get into the video clip I want to play, I want to show you uh, and play a quick example of, um, of a song called uh, CSS Decoder. Uh, has any, is everyone familiar with this one? <laughs> All right, there's a large chuckle. All right, so this is an AIFF file, and let me just make sure we have sound. There we go. This function is void. It takes two arcs. The first is SEC, a pointer to a vector of 20, 48 unsigned bytes that are in the encrypted disk sector and will be the decrypted. The second is key. A vector of six unsigned bytes, the decrypted title key. Local variables T1 through T6 are unsigned ints. All right, so <laughs> there we have an oral culture once again in the sense of how people uh, employ information <laughs> to create culture. Um, the, this guy's name was Joe Recker. He made a, a sort of a critique of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and recorded it as a folk music tune and posted it to MP3, uh, where somehow it, the rumor spread that someone had um, taken the, the verbal rendition of the software, uh, i.e. he sang it, and then um, made it into a song, you know, kind of a, the guitar, everything. Uh, so here we have oral text becoming the equivalent of a software that is then distributed as shareware. Uh, 
and given out for free. Um, MP3 kind of got wind that someone was doing a spoof on this, and then various large-scale corporations got in touch with them to remove it from the site. But by then, someone had made a T-shirt <laughs> with the exact same lyrics um, on the back. I'll just pass that. You know, if you guys want to take a look, or and so it's you're. I'm trying to just sort of point to this metaphor of how software, oral culture, and the notion of uh, sort of folk culture all have converged in a digital environment. And um, these are all issues that in a, you know just fly right in the face of uh, most notions of control, you know control of information. So one of my mottos is electronic music is the folk music of the 21st century. We're looking at a culture where. Uh, almost 30,000 records and CDs are recorded a year, uh, exponentially greater than almost any other time in recorded, again, I, all puns intended, recorded history. And uh, that's only increasing. And if you look at also the, the software culture online and the way uh, people are, are they're creating almost every style of being able to uh, you know, mix, transform, and change information, it's, it's basically become a kind of an undercurrent in the culture in general. So um, I want to play a video clip. I, I was just was called on to a TV show called Tech TV, which is um, a relatively mainstream uh, multimedia-oriented TV channel, but it also, it's also a show. And um, a friend of mine named Chris Chixmansahi, he's a Eastern European, it's a strange last name, uh, he invented what they call a turntable, a DJ robot. And um, actually, the video clip will speak for itself. It, the whole idea is this kind of notion of, again, collaborative filtering, how people uh, think about sound, record it, and then uh, distribute it. So can we play the video clip? Oh, you have to, you have to, you have to rewind it for a second. Sorry. Uh, well, it's probably better to stop it and then. Right, punishing abuse, that and much more. But um, so this app, this was last Friday, just two days ago. and. Um, Chris is a roboticist at MIT who works on uh, robots, everything from sending them in to find out if they're bombs in a car to uh, he's uh, in the middle of getting together some models to ship to Afghanistan to search caves for terrorists, for example. But he's also a hobby uh, sort of closet DJ. So it's very rare that you usually have someone who's both well-versed with software and machinery and also knows about music. So he's at a, a sort of a triple kind of whammy. But um, so my phone rings a couple months ago, and he's like, Paul, remember that robot idea we were talking about a while ago? Well, come by the studio up at uh, MIT and check it out. So this software is uh, based on C++, and the, the entire concept is meant to be something that is able to take found objects, meaning records, and create new material from it, but as a robot. So well, how far back did they go? It, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's only strictly six minutes on it. It's like a small clip. So here we go. Scratches. Wait, we still haven't rewound all the way. Did it go to the beginning? Yeah, just press rewind. It, it's a short, tiny clip. There we go. All right, folks, bust out your dancing shoes. Hip hop is going robotic. Washington Bureau Chief Peter Barnes has a story of a professor at MIT who thinks he's built a better mousetrap for hip hop disc jockeys. Hip hop is going robotic. A robot disc jockey that spins, scratches, and mixes. The man behind this music maker is MIT Media Lab professor Chris Cheek Semihai. He created the program that makes the Robo Jockey. Does just about anything a real one can. So there's Aretha Franklin singing Rock Steady. Um, if we if we go over here, I can scratch through the system. Okay, and then I can actually record that scratch. And it'll save that scratch and replay it. 
The system can help DJs, giving them the ability to work up to 128 turntables at once. But it could also replace the DJ altogether, playing pre-programmed music sets of up to 50 minutes long. Cheek sent me hi, a hip-hop fan, says he's not trying to put DJs out of business. What I've essentially done is captured the motion of a DJ um, without necessarily even having to capture the sound. So a DJ can then begin to build compositions of these different motions and play in ways with multiple turntables that, um, that they wouldn't be able to alone. At a Washington, D.C. nightclub called Dream, the idea of robot DJs went over like a Lawrence Welk album. DJ Chuck Dirty Hands Cook has seen the technology. When you're spinning in a club and you got people rocking, you don't want to think about a bunch of crap. You want to just be able to look down and grab records and do your thing. You don't want to have to sit there and, and constantly be pushing buttons on the computer. Peter Barnes, Tech TV. Well, Chris hasn't gotten any orders for his robot DJ yet, but he says he really doesn't expect to get any. What he really does want to do is compete in DJ competitions to show that it can work. The one time he did compete against a live DJ, he says he lost big time. He has since used that experience to work on improving the software. So, what do flesh and blood mix masters think of the robo DJ? Well, Paul Miller, a.k.a. DJ Spooky, helped develop it and he joins us now to discuss whether or not we all should book the robo dj for our next party nice to have you here dj spooky hi it's a pleasure to be here we want to know is this uh, is this thing going to send you and your friends uh to the end of the unemployment line no not at all i mean the, you have to remember it's a robot that can learn by mimicking human gestures so it's always a sense of what people have done then migrates into a mechanical and electronic environment so you know, it's just a part of the whole continuum of culture at this point. I mean, every time you even dial a phone and you, like, you, know, you hear something, this is AT&T. That's right. a human voice being simulated by a robot. But I think it's going to be more fun when you can control 128 turntables versus just two. You know, let's put it that way. So one of those amazing talents that you were talking about just happens to be you because you helped model this, uh, this machine, did you not? Um, well, mainly the idea is, is Chris is completely, two zillion percent his. It's mainly just like a lot of conversations about how people think about the gestures of the scratch, you know, when people are kind of rhyming, and then, then you have the DJ create a whole sense of the environment, you know, mm -hmm. with the scratches and stuff. So the robot was able to kind of mimic that. But um, it's going to be something that's an involving process. So Chris will be always kind of the programming you know, behind that. I'm just kind of uh, an advisor. So Let's here's a like question that. for you. Um, isn't a DJ spinning all about that, that person's interpretation of the music, the feel of the music, their taste, their style, their personality? This thing's a machine. It, it can spin these platters, but it's not going to give it that extra touch. Um, well, that's where you get to the point where it's like how in 2001, you know, it's just kind of those strange inconsistencies in a program that allow it to learn. Um, and I think that we we'll probably will see a kind of eventual process where the robot's able to create its own style. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's absorbing a lot of other DJ styles. And that's kind of interesting to see, too, because I can actually hear, okay, that's Mixmaster Mike from the Beastie Boys doing one style, and then the robot's able to pick up on that. Or then you hear right. you know, the Executioners, which is this other hip-hop group. You know, but it's able to mimic that, and it's able to learn by mimicking. So right. eventually, I think it'll, you'll be able to combine so many styles that it has its own. But it's really only as good as the DJ that's using it. Is that um, fair to say? Well, uh, let's put it this way. It's as good as the programming. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right. Well, we know that it's been used at some parties and nightclubs already. Uh, were you there? Have you seen the reaction from the crowd? What is the feel and the energy like? Um, I've seen videotapes. Mm -hmm. I've been, I, I travel a lot, so it's one of those things where a, a lot of my life is lived through the recorded experience, so I actually have to watch <laughs> TV reels, videotapes, websites, sound files, you name it, to see how people respond to things. Right. So, um, the crowd reaction I've seen is people are more curious about the technology at the moment mm -hmm. than the sounds. So people are they're, they're stunned. They see all uh, the DJ just walks away and the robot takes over. And so people are like, "What's going on?" Right. And then they see these three, you know, kind of rotating discs spinning and doing different things. And that's that's in itself a strange novelty to be at a big party and all of a sudden the sound switches and you realize it's it's a machine. Um, so. It's, you know, it's a little bit like Fred Flintstone meets uh, 2001 right now. Let's feel like that, you know? Well, we okay, know that so you've been pretty forward-thinking in, in your... But, so the basic idea is to be able to have styles uh, representing lots and lots and lots of the fragments that people use to make mixes. So earlier, for example, we saw... Um, I'm sorry, I forget his name. The, the professor with the, I think it was Digital Performer Software. 
um, and you break apart a whole track using elements. And so that's, that's the basic paradigm at this point. And with scratching, you're doing a similar thing by taking very small snippets of sounds and incorporating them into a new performance. So it's both a crossroads of quotation, you know, and, this, and there's a famous essay Emerson wrote where um, he talks about of quotation and originality, in which basically says there is no originality. Everything always is a quotation of a quotation. And it was a real pleasure to hear the jazz motif uh, mentioned earlier, and even if you look at the linguistic idea of vernacular, um, it's something where you have a system or a code of, of specific uh, units that become a kind of a, a language in itself. And jazz was a great way of translating many of the experiences of different regions into one seamless kind of uh, sound. Um, so I guess I sh I'm depending on how long people think about the notion of originality as the core element of the creative act. Um, I think we're seeing, that the reason I played the, the tape of the DJ as a robot is basically to point out that we're at the, the sort of a liminal point where the, the origins of the sounds no longer necessarily have to give them context. And um, before I came here, I was just doing a little bit of research for the panel, and it was a real pleasure to see uh, various senators involved with the Hollings Act, uh, Orrin Hatch, for example, or Trent Lott. Uh, they have a group called the, uh, the Singing Senators. And um, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll have a remix of that one out soon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's... Um, you know, the, the, uh, the idea of seeing Orrin Hatch, who's a very conservative senator, uh, de defend uh, the normal copyright issues when, you know, say, for example, most of his music is based on appropriation of gospel music, for example. Um, and I'm sure very few gospel people are getting paid by him singing that. But, um, you know, there's, there's this, again, there was mentioned earlier, the disjunction between the actual culture as people live it, where, say, for example, people make mixtapes, download files with ease and as a basic format for how people live life in an information culture um, versus the sort of corporate structure that RIA, the recording industries um, group, has tried to focus so intensively on creating a very artificial uh, structure. And so I think in terms of common use and common law, most people are going to bypass most, almost all control of, of information. So um, it's a fundamental kind of idea of folk culture that we're returning to, and that's kind of what I wanted to point out. And the idea of the robot as a displacement of all that. It's just a, a very uh, fun sense of humor. So um, should we, how should we proceed for the next person speaking, or do you want to? Just a little, uh, two quick notes. Um, the first, the, the song that you heard, the DCSS song, is one of a number of, of such versions. The, the reason that that song is kind of a, um, a sort of inside joke for lawyers, which is why, intellectual property lawyers, which is why people laughed when uh, Paul mentioned it, is the um, code being uh, sung aloud there, and in some rap versions being sort of read aloud, and, and there, are, there, are very, there are many, many other uh, different versions of it, is the code for a, um, a program which decrypts uh, or which just simply allows you to play DVDs, um, a uh, code which was found to be an infringement of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and uh, it was found to be an infringement of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to uh, post that uh, on a website and in an online magazine. And there were a series, there's been some very interesting litigation uh, about that in which the court uh, held that while uh, it was in some sense protected speech, nevertheless regulation of it uh, was uh, permissible under the First Amendment. Um, as a result, the, since there's a, a long tradition of First Amendment cases of uh, trying to find forms of expression that are protected that are unprotected, so that, for example, in Cohen versus California, uh, the uh, court says that it's a, a violation of the First Amendment to stop one, someone wearing a T-shirt which says, fuck the draft, uh, saying that <laughs> merely substituting the words, I strongly resent the draft, would not have quite the same uh, impact. Um, some of the artists involved have attempted to take this DCSS code and put it in various different media to make the point that this is a form of expression and their belief that it should not be regulated in the way that it's being regulated. Um, the second thing is to say that um, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning our panelists have very kindly agreed to be kept to about 20 minutes. I am the, the sort of the timekeeper here, and so we'll be making various arcane signals at them during the presentation. It's not that I'm attempting to pass love notes, but rather that I'm just trying to tell them that their time is winding down. Our next panelist, uh, Fred Konigsberg, is a partner at White & Case. White & Case is uh, one of the most distinguished law firms uh, in the United States. He is also um, counsel to uh, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, 
ASCAP. And uh, he's uh, someone who has worked with Congress, uh, worked with the Copyright Office and um, the Copyright Arbitration Royalty Panel. It's very important, given its acronym, not to call it the Copyright Royalty Arbitration Panel, because that completely change, changes the, from, from, the acronym from CARP to something more um, unfortunate. Um, and so his experience across a range of these issues is really uh, unparalleled. Fred, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, by the way, I do have, those of you who are old enough to remember the Cultural Revolution with everybody holding up the little red book, I've got the little purple book. It's the Copyright Law of the United States. I have it here not so much for reference as the, the way a, 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 a revival minister would have a Bible next to him on the lectern. I don't propose to open it, but it's there for moral comfort. Uh, as we were talking about what, what each of us would talk about today, I thought, um, as we talked about it, especially after a lot of the questions that came up in the first panel, it was clear that there are a lot of you out there who are, one, not lawyers, two, not law students, three, have no conception of what the quote, law is at least the basic, uh, the basic principles from which the world doesn't quite, can't quite figure out where to go with this stuff is, it would be useful for me to, to go over that for you. Then to talk a little bit further about something that Tim talked about this, uh, this morning uh, or, or earlier, which was the, um, what actually goes on in the real world in terms of what people have and what rights have. And then, then I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about some unintended consequences and unintended effects uh, that flow from things that go on in this area that I think are worth thinking about, um, even though you And I'll illustrate that with a story. It's a story of, uh, of a guy one night who has a very vivid dream. And in the dream, things come to him in sequences of four, four ducks in a pond, four planes in the sky, four boats on the river, four cars on the road. Very vivid, he wakes up. It's very much in his mind. He can't figure out what it means, but he knows it means something. Uh, all day long, it's nagging at him. Finally, late in the afternoon, he finally gets it. He runs out to the racetrack and gets there at 4.44 p.m., just in time for the fourth race, reaches in his pocket. He has $444. So he goes up to window number four. He puts it all down on horse number four, and sure enough, the horse finishes fourth. <laughs> there are some effects like that here, and we'll talk about them. Let's first talk about the, the, the copyright law, real basics here, so you have a sense of what's involved here. As somebody mentioned in passing this morning, every recording of music contains, I shouldn't say every, virtually every recording of music contains not one, but two separate and distinct copyrighted works created by different people and owned by different people. One is the underlying musical composition, the song, for most of us is the way we would think of it. It's created by a songwriter, maybe more than one, a composer and a lyricist. They enter into a business relationship with an entity called a music publisher. By and large, those business relationships are, are very productive and, and very amicable. And they own the copyright in the song, the underlying musical composition. Then every recording has something else called a sound recording. That is that particular fixation of sounds, that particular rendition of the song. That rendition is made by a performing artist who usually enters into a business relationship with an entity called a record company. Those relationships are not necessarily so amicable, as you may have read. More about that, perhaps, in a bit. There's a very important message that underlies that. As we think about what should be done in this area, as we think about the questions uh, that Daphne raised, remember that these creative works, the song and the sound recording, were created by human beings who have a stake in them and whose livelihood depends upon them. Songwriters don't earn money digging ditches. They earn their livings and support their families writing songs. And when you think of songwriters, please don't just think of people like Bruce Springsteen and, and Stevie Wonder and Cole Porter and Irving Berlin, all those people who have made great successes and have lots and lots of money from their songwriting. Think also about the people whose names you have never heard who write great songs and who make enough to make their living at this, at this occupation, but not a great deal more than that. Remember that you're dealing with human beings here when you're talking about using works that have been created by other people. And remember that you always have to keep that in mind when you talk about the uses that culturally we want to see made there are people 
who have created those works to begin with. The copyright law grants five basic rights. Four of them really are involved when we're talking about sampling. The, the basic right is the right to reproduce the copyrighted work in copies. That is the clearest right that is being used when we talk about sampling. You are reproducing somebody else's song or somebody else's sound recording, two works, remember, when you are sampling it and putting into your recording and your new musical composition that you've created. Secondly, there's a right to distribute those works in copies to the public. That follows if somebody raised the question of what happens if I just do this and keep it in my own recording device in my own garage? Well, you're not distributing it to the public then, but if you're doing anything commercially, you are distributing it to the public. Third is the right to make a derivative work. These are the rights that the creator of the work has from the moment the work is created. The right to recast it, transform it, adapt it, make it into something new. That is a basic right that the creator of the work has. Lastly, fourth is the right to perform the copyrighted work publicly. We talked about ASCAP and BMI, organizations that exist to give songwriters and music publishers the ability to license the ubiquitous public performances that take place throughout the world when their works are performed. Radio, TV, cable, nightclubs, bars, grills, taverns, gin mills, and all the rest. There's a fifth right, the right to display the copyrighted work publicly. One doesn't usually think about that in the context of music, although as a footnote, I add that what Anthony and Scott did this morning when they showed you software that actually puts up the musical notation, that is a display of the musical work. But that right is not terribly valuable in the commercial context. So the reproduction and distribution rights, along with the right to make derivative works, are really what we're talking about when we talk about cre using a sample to create a new work. And then, of course, there's the right of public performance, which follows whenever the original work or the sample is performed. Now, having said that, what's involved? Well, Tim earlier gave you a, 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 little, a little sample of what's involved when, when the rights are, are, uh, are licensed out there in the commercial marketplace. Um, the core is that there is a pure negotiation. We had a question earlier, a really excellent question about why can't there be a collective rights licensing organization for sampling in the way that ASCAP licenses the right of public performance. A radio station gets one license from ASCAP that covers all the performance of all the music in the ASCAP repertory they perform, and that's it. They pay one annual license fee. They don't, it doesn't matter whether they perform a lot or little. It's covered. And that's that. It's very simple. It's very easy. It's very good for the users of music. And we talked about why that, that might not work in this area. Although I, I'm a firm believer in collective licensing, one thing you must understand about collective licensing, by the way, is that all of the individuals, all of the songwriters who got together and formed ASCAP gave up the right to say no, which goes back to something that Daphne was saying earlier. They, in return for getting a means of actually making their livelihoods from the public performance of their music, which is the largest single source of their income, they gave up the right to say, no, anybody who wants an ASCAP license gets one. It's not a matter of, well, we don't like you, we're not going to give it to you. You want a license, you've got it. Just pay the reasonable license fee. That's the only thing that's required. OK. So in the case of sampling, however, for the various reasons we talked about, there are individual negotiations uh, that go on. And, and I, yesterday, knowing I was coming on to this program, I talked to a, a client and a friend who is with one of the very large music publishing companies. And I said, what's the range of fees that are charged in sampling? I mean, I had a sense of it, but I wanted to get it from him. And he said, well, it's not really fees that are charged for sampling. What you do from the perspective of the songwriter, the music publisher, is you get a piece of the copyright in the resulting new work. I said, OK, what's the, because if you have a piece of the copyright, then you collect the royalties that are due. And I want to talk about what those royalties are in a second. I said, OK, well, what's, what's, what's the range of percents that you get? He says, well, at the very bottom, you probably get 5 or 10% if it's a relatively small sample. It's the only thing. It's just a little bit. I said, that's great. What's the top end? He said, well, it's very famous in the music business what the top end is. And it was in, and then he named the work for me. And it's a work that we've been talking about today. 
And for those of you over the age of 25, let's play a little bit for you. If you got to be over the age of 25, however. <laughs> Nobody. That's frightening. If you're under the age of 25, name that tune. <laughs> Thank you. It's every breath you take by the police. It was sampled. But that's not every breath you take. Right? What that is, is Sean Combs, a.k.a. Puff Daddy, a.k.a. P. Diddy, a.k.a. God only knows what today. Sean Combs called I'll Be Watching You with Faith Hill, who was the widow of Notorious B.I.G., which was an act that Sean Combs developed, and, this was who, and who was killed, who was murdered. And this is Puff Daddy's tribute to his friend Notorious B.I.G. And the question was, OK, what did Sting, who wrote that song, what did Sting get out of the copyright for um, I'll Be Watching You, which is the Puff Daddy version of it? And the answer is 100%. Sean Combs got zip, zero. That was agreed upon, agreed upon. Maybe there were factors that led him to agree to get zero from it, but 100% of that <laughs> went to sting. Um, that's the range that you get. Now, what are the royalties that flow to everybody involved in here? Well, one of them, and, and actually this was, this was alluded to by David earlier in a comment, is the, the mechanical royalty. And what the heck is the mechanical royalty? The copyright law going back to 1909, said that after the first recording of a song is issued, first recording of a song, anybody else, that is to say any other musician working for a record company, in parenthesis, can record that song without getting permission upon payment of a statutory fee, a fee fixed by the law to the, to the songwriter and the music publisher. That fee is now something like seven and a half cents per song per album distributed, which when you add it up for a platinum album, which has one song on it, comes out to something like 75,000 bucks, which in the grand scheme of things is very little when you realize that the record company, given that the retail price of the record, uh, the wholesale price of the record is about 10 bucks for a platinum album, which sells a million copies, is getting $10 million and withholding all of it from the performing artist, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so. Standard industry practice is that this stuff gets negotiated out. And one of the reasons I think you, see, you have seen so little litigation of it is that the industry says, look, we want to do this. How do we do it? Here it is. This is the way we do it. One of the interesting factors involved, I think, is that the, um, very frequently the sample is put in not by the artist, but by the record producer. Very frequently after the artist has left the studio and the record producer is playing with it. Uh, I assume that they will get the artist's consent. I got this great idea. We're going to put in a sample from such and such. And the artist says, yeah, that sounds great. Sure, go ahead and do it. And very frequently, a Tim noticed, noted that this stuff should all be done in advance, but very frequently it isn't. And again, because everybody wants this to work, you catch up with facts after, after they occur. Uh, the permission is almost always after the fact. And that creates a very interesting unintended, unforeseen, maybe that's the better way to put it, an unforeseen consequence. Negotiate, by the way, I've got to tell you my favorite negotiation story. Um, it's two um, performing artists who haven't seen each other in a long time run into each other on the street. And one of them says, how you doing? And the other guy says, great, I just signed a $10 million with, deal with EMI. And the first guy says, wow, that's great. He says, yeah, if only I could get EMI to sign it. <laughs> well. That's negotiation for you. Here's one of the unintended, unforeseen effects of sampling, which the, the industry, the business, the recording artists have to deal with, the record companies have to deal with, the music publishers and the songwriters have to deal with, which nobody probably thought about. In their contracts, 
mostly unconscionable with performing artists, the record companies put in something called the Controlled Composition Clause. The Controlled Composition Clause says that goes back to the mechanical royalty that we talked about, that seven and a half cents per song per record distributed. The, the controlled composition clause that says that any composition that the recording artist controls any piece of, that is to say is also the songwriter on, gets not the full mechanical rate, but some fraction of it, three quarters of the mechanical rate, half the mechanical rate, whatever it is. It's a way of cutting back on what the record company has to pay to the performing artist. I, I feel like one of those ads on, on late night TV, what would you pay for all the secrets of the universe? Wait, don't answer yet. What if we threw in a set of Ginsu knives? Now how much would you pay? $39.95? $49? That's not the only thing the, comp the controlled composition clause says. It also says <clears throat> that um, there's a limit on the total amount of mechanical royalties that the record company will pay out. And to the, for example, if, a, if the album has 14 cuts, the record company says, we'll only pay the equivalent of the full mechanical on eight of them. Anything over and above that gets charged back to the recording artist, gets charged back as, as, a, uh, as a charge against the advance that he's gotten. It's another way of cutting down what's paid. But when you're using samples, depending upon the extent of the sample you're using, that involves a mechanical royalty because you're reproducing the copyrighted musical composition in a sound recording. And the songwriter and the music publisher is entitled to be paid by that. It may be only a fraction of the regular mechanical, but when you've got a lot of samples, it adds up. And so once again, you see that the recording artist is getting the short end of the stick because of an artistic expression. And this has nothing to do with the law, kids. This has everything to do with the relations within the industry, which is something that we haven't talked about here, but something that I think bears discussion, which is, are the relations of the various entities within the industry contributing to what Daphne referred to, I think it was Daphne referred to as a break upon the use of the technology and culture these days? I'm not going to give an answer to that question. Everybody can answer that question uh, as, as you think about it. But it is, I think, a, a key question that we haven't talked about and that we should think about. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Fred. Um, I, it's, he, because of that uh, fine presentation, it's pr prompted in me an urge I cannot stop, which is to tell an Orrin Hatch story. Um, well, I got one too. You go first. <laughs> um, Senator Hatch appeared at a conference I went to on the, called the Future of Music uh, Conference. And um, he stared out in some confusion at 9 o'clock in the morning at about 800 musicians, 90% of them dressed in black, all of them looking somewhat puzzled to be up this early in the morning. I realize this is a gross stereotype. It still appeared to me to be true, I have to say. Not all stereotypes are false. Um, and he looked out at them, and they looked at him, and there was just massive mutual incomprehension going on. You know, he, he's wearing a nice suit, and they're kind of looking at him, and, and they're waiting for him to be hostile to their lifestyle and interests. And what he started off by saying was that he loved Napster, and there was some pause at all of this, because he uh, writes and listens to Mormon devotional music, and he can't get that distributed because of the terrible structure of the music distribution <laughs> companies. You know, those devotional music companies won't distribute my music because they say it's not Christian music, and they're Christian controlled, and we're G the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and I don't say why they don't, why they don't say that's Christian, but in any, way, any case it is, and they should distribute it, and if it weren't for Napster, I couldn't get my music out. So there was then there's this great roar of applause for this, and then <laughs> He, he then said, and what I don't understand is all about these, uh, these contracts that they sign. I mean, and he then ran through the various chargebacks and um, pitfalls and potholes and unconscion uh, potential unconscionability of the typical music contract. And uh, his uh, said quite clearly to Hillary Rosen, who was actually saying there, that, um, that if you wanted to go on complaining about the loss to the individual recording artists, and I think Fred's point about separating the discussion of songwriters from artists and about talking about the intra 
uh, industry points as well as the relationships between the consumer and the industry. Both of those are very well taken. He said, if you, if, you, if you in the recording industry want to talk about how you need congressional help in order to prevent people from doing things which are illegal, like using Napster, then surely you, and you're going to use as your justification the giving of money to the artists, then aren't you going to have to put your own house in order uh, in terms of the amount of money flowing back there? So while Fred is right to say that there is a... Um, disjunction between what the law is and what the deals that are made, the contracts that are made are not ones that are required by the law, they're ones that have to do with bargaining power. There is another kind of link, which is, as we go forward, what kinds of deals are going to be cut by the Congress, partly because of that. If but I may, Jamie, one more word about Orrin Hatch, and it goes to what Paul <laughs> said. Orrin Hatch is not a member of the singing senator, he's got a lousy voice. Uh, but Orrin Hatch is a songwriter. He writes devotional music. Um, and, yeah, and just two things, I asked him, uh, you know, how did you come to do it? He said, I was sitting up there at all these hearings, and Strom Thurmond was going on, and it's the only thing that keeps me sane. He said, was right. <laughs> he's a lyricist. Uh, the other thing was, I was talking to him, we were telling him, he said, well, I, I, and he's, by the way, his stuff is put out by a branch of Sony Music, and he said, he, was talking, he said, well, I got I to gotta fly off now, I got to go to Nashville. And, we're going to Nashville for a second. He says, oh, i got to lay down some tracks. <laughs> I thought he's picking up on the lingo real good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. On that note, I'm going to turn to um, our next panelist, Dick Hebdige. Um, Dick is uh, one of the most uh, distinguished writers on uh, culture and cultural studies, um, both in the United Kingdom and in uh, the United States. He's now the director of Interdisciplinary Humanities Center at, and also a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, um, and a former dean of the uh, writing program at the California Institute of Arts. He's the author of some books which, if you haven't read, I strongly recommend to you. Um, uh, I have to admit, I've only read um, Subculture, The Meaning of Style, and Cut and Mix, Culture, Identity, and Caribbean Music. But both of those uh, have, in their different ways, both in their dealings with uh, subcultures, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom, or in dealing with the formation of genres and music, a lot to do with what we're talking about today. So uh, let me turn it over to Dick Hebdige. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I feel rather pretentious with this in front of me, because all, I've just got a uh, text that I'm going to read out, because I couldn't get it together to get the thing printed. So. I'm not going to be able to do any digital manipulation like Paul did. I'm totally stuck in clunky analog, and I'll be uh, trying to uh, coordinate the, uh, the, the bits and pieces that I want to show. I want to begin with a clip from a documentary I made with a, a German new media artist, Rot Route Tape, for French hyphen German TV, broadcast in 1999, that dealt with 30 years of club and dance culture. The documentary takes as a loose structuring device the rather facile trope I remember. So at this point, I'm remembering the golden days of sampling, I guess, in the early 80s. Um, and I think it's rather odd that both Paul and I have chosen to use these kind of pre-recorded surrogates of ourselves uh, <laughs> whilst you're sitting here at home. <laughs> uh, Co-present with us, so could you start the video? Hip hop comes out of the Bronx at the point where recording and reproduction technologies like the boombox, personal stereo, turntables, um, audio tape, etc. weren't just cheaper, more portable and more available than ever before, but when a whole generation had grown up with these technologies, not just listening to the product, but screwing around with it on machines. My car, don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm this new generation, people like Grandmaster Flash and Melly Mel, grew up wearing headphones, and they were exposed to a vastly expanded rhythmic repertoire. While hip hop is, in one way, you know, the essence of uh, street music made on a shoestring, it's also at the same time uh, highly sophisticated uh, technically and highly educated rhythmically. In a word, it's cosmopolitan.
I remember when I first encountered hip hop in New York in the early 80s, what knocked me out was this uh, combination of technical virtuosity and raw power. Kids spinning on their heads, hands flashing back and forth at lightning speed across two or three turntables. DJs began talking about DJing as if they were making love with the product. Um, DJs would talk about uh, touching wax, stroking vinyl, very sensuous, intimate kind of contact. It was as if records were no longer just physical objects, but living beings. What you say? That's cool. And as sampling technologies began to develop, which could break down records into their genetic components, building blocks uh, for sound engineers and DJs, that's exactly what records became, in a sense, animate matter. That gives a flavour of, uh, of the time, uh, I hope. Um, one of the things I especially like about DJ culture as opposed to what uh, Larry Grossberg calls the rock formation or other proscenium arch modes of musical address is the way it leaves the audience to audit and to edit the transmitted material, the way it makes the audience grope or climb across the cut or the break that divides one side, one track, one sample from its neighbours on the loop or the sampled sequence. In that spirit, I'm going to spin two sides of the sampling coin or sampling disc this afternoon back to back in the hopes that some ideas may spin out the conjunction. So the first sampling, the original DJ version, and uh, this is a kind of attempt to revisit some of the um, issues I was trying to explore in the uh, 80s in uh, Cut and Mix. While the first digital samplers like the Fairlight CMI and the Roland DMX made sampling as a technique generally accessible by making it possible for musicians and soundscape designers to prolong the length of the sample and play it through a keyboard. The idea of sampling as a radical alternative to the tabula rasa model of composition, where the solitary genius breaks with tradition by inventing his own materials, the gender is marked, without recourse to quotation, with his back, as it were, turned against the archive, this alternative notion of production as channeling the archive, as plunder phonics, citation and sampling, has analogous antecedents going back to medieval scholarship, the chapbook and the copybook. Though long before the development of plagiarism search engines programmed to recognize um, authorial stylistic signatures, long, be, uh, before, long before the gleeful public outing of previously respected scholars um, like, hang on, <laughs> I'm, I'm lost here now. Which Pulitzer Prize? Yeah, well, <laughs> Steve, uh, Stephen Ambrose, and, oh, hang on, how do I do this? Perhaps, Paul, you can help me. Which one? I, I've lost me, uh, my, uh, my, my text. Is it Word? Yeah, uh, it's kind of gone to the left there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think no, it's, it's, it's nothing literal. ideological about no. that. So, what do you think? PDF file? Yeah. What do I do? Click on, click on the left. Arrow click on the, the left. Yeah, the left arrow on the bottom. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No. So you see what an idiot yeah. I am? Right. Previously respected scholars like Doris Kearns uh, Goodwin and Steve, uh, Stephen Ambrose, uh, the etymology of the word plagiarism, which shares a root with the Latin word for kidnapping suggests a history of moral concern about and censure of unattributed citation that certainly predates capitalism and the John lockdown on property rights and property relations accomplished so successfully in the 18th century. And while Beethoven lifted tunes from Mozart, Verdi from Schubert, and while, as the music critic Philip Hope Wallace remarked, under the spreading chestnut tree is no more than a syncopated version of Rock of Ages, and while I might add in parenthesis, in parenthesis, I lifted that entire sentence, more or less verbatim, from John Chesterman and Andy Lippmann's 1988 book, The Electronic Pirates, DIY Crime of the Century, sampling 
is an explicitly articulated, as an explicitly articulated subcultural ethos and aesthetic, is more directly linked to that array of textual strategies, um, including inter alia, automatic writing, collage, cut up, music, con concrete, championed by the metropolitan modernist and avant garde movements that for over a century have been hacking away at the theology of authorship and the myth of unadulterated novelty, genius, and originality associated with it. Post-structuralist theory and post-structuralist poetic, lit crit avant-garde like the Parisian journal Tell Tell should be included in that list as part of the no doubt petty bourgeois aesthetic revolt against capitali uh, capitalist property relations and the forms of subjectivity inscribed and reproduced within those relations. It's worth recalling, for example, that Roland Barthes' famous Death of the Author essay, the single most concise and widely circulated formulation of the idea that the author is nothing more than the sum of the assumptions of psychological consistency, meaning, and unity that readers in crit and critics impose upon that is read into a text. It's worth recalling that that essay first appeared in English, not in a journal of literary theory, but in a special issue of the contemporary art journal, Aspen Review, published in 1967 as a box containing loose-leaf documents, artworks, musical scores, as well as Bart's essay, designed to showcase recent American conceptual art, all focused on the theme of impersonal or automatic practice, and including specially commissioned works by, if I remember right, among others, Sol Witt and John Cage. But there are other more immediate sources for sampling as it developed in the early 80s in the work of avant-gardists and hip-hoppers alike, sources located well outside the academic canon. Plunderphonics composers like John Oswald and John Zorn, for instance, both mention as a powerful influence Carl Stalling, who sculpted the Looney Tunes soundtracks for Warner Brothers, the tessellated uh, sonic backdrops composed of ruptured tempos over-amplified sound effects, sudden screams and pips and whistles and squeaks to Tex Avery's Bugs Bunny cartoon. Other sources of inspiration for early samplers include Ennio Morricone, who uh, incorporated chunks of found sound into his spare idiosyncratic soundtracks for the Italian director Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Western, starring Eastwood, shot in Spain. Uh, I was going to use, I thought I might have a boombox and be able to play my uh, old tapes, but I, 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 I couldn't do that. I can't move back and forth, so. You know, you know the soundtracks like that. Do <laughs> little wah, 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 <coughs> ah. You know, that kind of thing. So I just thought I'd remind you of that one. Um, long before the internet, the proto-sampling aesthetic, I was like, you know, I'm talking about this Italian director, an Italian composer, working on myths of the American West using Clint Eastwood, shooting it in Spain. Long before the internet, the pro proto-sampling aesthetic was all over the place, viral and promiscuous in its modes of transmission, mutation, and replication. So coincidentally, Morricone was also a major influence on Lee Scratch Perry, the extraordinarily prolific and influential record producer, engineer, and sound sculptor, who with others like Joe Gibbs, Bunny Lee and King Tubby of Sukoxon Dodds sound system in Backerwall and downtown uh, Kingston in Jamaica, pioneered dub and talk over reggae, prototypes, if not the prototypes, for US rap and hip hop at Black Ark Studios in Jamaica in the late 60s and early 70s. Though if we're talking dub wise fashion now, the roots go back, back and forth much further to the West African griot tradition to African and Afro-Caribbean boast songs, Jamaican mento, to Baptist hymns and Pentecostal shouts and Kalinda chants, and Rastafarian drum and chant and Bura music, to the sans humanite calypsos of 1940s Trinidad. And that's just a few uh, lines of flight that we can check onto as we pursue the ultimately untrackable, impossibly dense network of filiation and affiliation that compose dubwise composition. Which is just another way of saying dub, 
the space of sampling is at once an archival space and a space of forgetting, a space where you can lose your bearings, find your feet, where you can learn to think critically differently. Could you play the Joe Gibbs dub? I hope it's going to come up. I'll talk over this. So it doesn't take up too much time. So dub is a place where you learn to tolerate the breaks, the empty spaces between the bass beats, where you can learn to hang and not get too nervous when things aren't neatly framed. Dub is built around the v reverb and the echo. Can you bring it up a little bit? Is that it? Is that as loud as it goes? Great. the formal condensation of that principle of versioning, which is at the heart of the reggae aesthetic, where an original song, rhythm or melody can generate any number of equally original and innovative versions. The versioning aesthetic is dialogical and open-ended and democratic. Anyone and everyone can have a say. And no one gets the last word because the true word is the living word. The dub, the space of sampling, is a utopian space, a placeless space that is also an inner space, a space you can fall into anywhere, a space, in other words, that discombobulates, that discombobulates all origins. So the, the, the second part of this uh, brief uh, review of uh, uh, sampling culture, from my perspective, is called the dub side, Mark of the Beast. However, on a more sober note, the wide open space, the promise sampling makes of a different way of organizing and distributing what, for want of a better word, I suppose we could call information, a different way of generating, organizing, and sustaining socio-cultural forms is always under siege because inexorably and always after capitalism's liberating function, the putting into circulation, the moment of dissemination, comes the moment of the fixed regulation, the calling in of debts, the double movement Jane Gaines has described, circulation, then restriction. So the wide open era of sampling ended pretty abruptly in the early 1990s with legal actions brought against John Osborne's Thunderphonic CD in December 89, against Della Soul for using a 12 second fragment of the Turtles song, You Showed Me on their 1989 track transmitting uh, live from Mars. This one was settled out of court, as I think somebody mentioned earlier, for $1.7 million. That is uh, at a rate of $147,666.47 per second. Against Biz Markey for lifting the first eight bars of Gilbert O'Sullivan's 1972 uh, hit Alone Again on the 1991 album I Need a Haircut. Uh, with, I think uh, this one's also been uh, sampled to today, Judge Kevin Thomas Duffy's ruling in Sullivan's favour, including the following unattributed citation from Moses, thou shalt not steal, <laughs> along with a number of implicit endorsements <laughs> of previously <laughs> prescribed moral rights and natural rights uh, arguments. Sampling, particularly facetious and parodic sampling, an intrinsic component of the versioning aesthetic and ethic, perhaps an intrinsic component of any healthy democracy, protected in earlier interpretations of US copyright exemption under the fair use rubric, went into a pretty sharp decline from this point onward. I've been told that in order to produce that tessellated structure, the sense of some sonic depth and spatial and temporal heterogeneity associated with sampling, many musicians and producers now make studio-generated simulations of externally sourced archival material, then pass them through a filter during production to simulate that old school found sound quality. The protection of copyright in the era of globally networked um, digital transmission and delivery systems, what would I know about it, <laughs> is to say the very least rather problematic. Last year, the Interne International Intellectual Property Alliance estimated that India was costing U.S. businesses over $300 million in pirated intellectual property, 
including 47 million in lost film revenues and 195 million dollars in pirated business software. And that CD piracy in Pakistan stood at over 90% with most major financial institutions and government ministries running their computers on pirated software. So that as film and legal studies scholar Nitin Govil has uh, recently and cogently argued, clearly US support of Pakistani and Indian integration into the global financial markets, the complex mass of international bank transactions and derivatives calculations powered by the pirated software clashes with its protracted efforts that these nations comply with international copyright harmonization. That's just one very vivid com contradiction as trade-offs and standoffs are staged in corporate ballrooms and international trade organizations across the globe between the rising cost of revenues lost to the pirates, attempts to push developing nations into stricter enforcement of copyright regulations now brokered through international organizations like the WTO, ventriloquized by US state and corporate interests. America, the copyright bandit of the 19th century, is now out to put the cop right back into copyright, is now busy sharpening the claw, i.e. the sea law in copyright law. There's the weighing of these losses and expenditures against the prospect of the potentially immense profits to be garnered but deferred into the midterm future when full integration, full compliance, compulsory harmonization and claw enforcement in a new US-centered global capitalist order come to fruition. I'm nearly finished. At another level, there are inherent impediments to any simple or direct application of copyright laws developed in hopes of regulating and incentivizing into, uh, IP intellectual property production in a world of analog, trying to transpose that to the digital domain. Uh, obviously, there are impediments for me, but beyond my, my technical incompetence, I think there are, there are intrinsic barriers to transposing copyright law developed in a world of analog to the digital d domain, particularly as one way of describing the internet is as a globally linked network of copying machines. It seems to me that the fundamental er analogy on which legal definitions of property are pre predicated, the rooting of the idea of property in land and enclosed space, seems to founder on the web, which is, as Govil again puts it, simultaneously a delivery conduit and an exhibition site, a distribution philosophy, a content gathering and talent differentiating device, and an advertising platform. And how can you make a clear distinction between idea and expression when it's impossible to distinguish between cargo and carrier? The contortions in the language and the logics currently used to try to bridge the gulf between the pre-digital and the digital world, software defined as literary works, attempts to grant even object languages, i.e. inter and intra-machinic command languages, protection under this rubric, seem not to put too fine a point on it and uh, not to resort to postures of time modernist outrage or old school literary pre preciosity, a bit of a stretch. So the trend seems to be, and some legal scholars seem to trace this back as far as the 1940s, away from copyright to other forms of intellectual property protection, most especially trademark law. In a recent article in the LA Times devoted to the challenge lodged before the Supreme Court on behalf of an internet library owner to the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act of 1998, which is the 11th extension of copyright granted by Congress in the last 40 years, a challenge that would put uh, Mickey Mouse and, uh, and uh, Donald Duck cartoons back in the public or in the public domain, it was reported that Disney executives have wheeled out Disney characters. Cast members, as employees are called, wearing heads at the shareholders' meeting in Connecticut. They are the reasons the Disney brand is so incredibly strong by any measure, thundered one combative Disney exec. They are the reasons the Disney brand is so incredibly strong. Integration has been the leading strategy of the Disney corporate business plan since at least the 1950s. Though as early as 1937, long before it became standard practice, Walt was linking merchandising to movie promotions, launching a line of toys and clothing to coincide with the release of Snow White in a maneuver I call serial or syntax selling. 
the absolute merger of the maker and the mark, the text and the brand, literally accomplished with digital watermarking technologies like Digimark, which brand the image with an identifiable signature that can then be tracked down with a search engine, appear to be speaking cultural trend spotter style the coming thing. Sue Ellen Case recently argued that in films like Tomb Raider, the lead protagonist functions as an avatar for the brand that owns the ensemble of merchandising spin-offs, the DVD, the game, the toys, the soda, for which the film itself is merely the advertisement. In the old swashbuckling piratical spirit of 1980s facetious quotation, I wanted to end with a short mu uh, music video clip from Disney's 1997 movie Hercules, where packaging functions as a film in, in the filmic plot. Um, in the apotheosis of Hercules from a quote hero to a zero, he attracts fans and mega wealth as thanks to a series of lucrative endorsements of everything from Herc's aid sports beverage to Air Herc sports sandals, he becomes a bona fide brand name from Hercules.com. Well, I, you know, I was going to show it, but I know I'm running out. Of I've run out of time, and I also managed, in my incompetence, to bring the wrong Hercules <laughs> tape. You may ask why, and probably it was providential because I understand that Fred rep has represented Walt Disney, and I don't <laughs> really want to spend a couple of years in in, in jail. I have handcuffs <laughs> here somewhere, but. <laughs> So uh, I, you know, I'm going to hand out actually this other second uh, uh, Hercules uh, tape. I don't know if this is against the law, but I don't want it back. <laughs> <laughs> Our final panelist, who very nobly agreed to, well, he, he was put last, and he accepted it with good grace. Let me not say he agreed to do it. That would be like talking like a record company executive, saying that someone agreed to the terms. Uh, they were imposed on him, and he smiled. Um, our last panelist is David Sanjak. We got started a little late, so we're going to finish a little late, too. Um, I first uh, met David, uh, I must have been shortly after he became director of the uh, BMI archives. Um, he's a historian, someone who's deeply involved in the music industry. He's been a consultant to the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the R&B Foundation, the Blues Foundation. Uh, he really has an unparalleled uh, knowledge of the field. He also wrote what I still think is um, the best article, um, both legally and historically, about this field, although doubtless Daphne's forthcoming publication of her talk today will uh, make it at least a little closer run. Uh, which is called Don't Have to DJ No More, Sampling and the Autonomous Creator. Shockingly, it is not on the internet, so far as I can find you. That's something you'd need to um, uh, put, put right, if I were you. Um, but he also, with his late father, Russell Sanjak, uh, wrote uh, Pennies from Heaven, the American popular music business from the, in the 20th century, and is now competing, uh, completing a book called Always on My Mind, Music, Memory, and Money. David Sanjak. Thank you. Um, there's about four basic points or ideas. Um, I'll, I'll refer to myself probably in one of the very few times in my life I will ever use a sports metaphor as, in fact, the cleanup batter. Um, that there are four sort of points or, or, or um, areas of interest that I'll, I'll uh, try to tie some, some knots together on so we can move to your addition to this discussion. And um, I also have to say before I begin, that, that Fred has, has, has done me quite a good deed by the fact that since we both work, one as legal representative and me with a direct paycheck from a performance rights organization, Fred has said everything that I would say if I needed to say something about what I do for a day job. And this gives me now the advantage of saying other things. <laughs> um, so, you know, of course, I assent to everything he, he said about what is important and necessary about elements of the law, so I can therefore not have to talk about that anymore. Um, let me begin by reference to something that uh, all of us are in one way or another fixated about, which is fixation. And um, read quickly from, from the book he held up a short while ago, the section 101 of the definition section, which I've always found a fascinating statement. It reads as follows. A work is fixed in a tangible medium of expression when its embodiment in a copy or phono record by or under the authority of its author is sufficiently permanent or stable to permit it to be perceived reproduced or otherwise communicated for a period of more than transitory duration. 
a work consisting of sounds, images, or both that are being transmitted, in quotes, is fixed, in quotes, for purposes of this title if a fixation of the work is being made simultaneously with its transmission. Now, what I've always found interesting in that, in that statement and in that, in that uh, concept is three incumbent and, and, and necessarily inferred definitions, which is both a fixed sense of what author is about, that we, that we can ascertainably define an author and that we can ascertainably define a process under which that author has created something. Secondly, that in that this is fixed and it's a, it's, it's a vehicle of transmission, there is in fact an implied and necessary receiver, hence audience, to these objects. And third, that there is in fact this tangible media, this, this tangible phenomenon. Um, I would have to say that, that it has always struck me that we're in fact the process that several people have uh, uh, alluded to today of our re-examining, perhaps redefining, rewriting the copyright law, that we would need to have to look at all of the underlying assumptions that I've just pointed to that relate to that notion of both fixation and fixed objects, fixed authors, and fixed audiences. Um, a moment ago, Dick brought up one of, I think, the most important elements within that, and something which, particularly in the advent in the last 10 to 15 years, though historically this is far from um, a new phenomenon, that in fact in pieces of intellectual property in the mass communication business are never in themselves fixed. I mean, he uses the, the metaphor of serial selling. I've used in print the notion that to a mass communication business, every piece of intellectual property is in a sense a piece of sourdough bread starter. And what you're really interested in is how many loaves of bread you can make with each new object. One of the reasons for that is then you can keep in circulation and reapply for copyrights for each of those new works. And one can keep then circulating under protection um, those objects. But the other thing too is that implied in that notion of fixation is the fixation of us as audience and us as bodies within this transmission of, of properties. And that there is implied in both that language and the law itself that there is really a pretty much unidirectional relationship between the creators, manufacturers, and owners of property and we as audience. That we are at the, we are at the tail end of that process. And that as uh, several people alluded to today, we have pretty much as defined by the law and as defined by corporations um, a part to play in that process mostly as a recipient, not as an active agent. And that one of the things that in a reconsideration of the law and in a reconsideration of the law necessitated by the advent of digital technology is that there is a necessarily multi-directional relationship. It's not a unidirectional system. Um, just to also allude to this notion of both cereal selling and sourdough bread, that going back to the example of Carl Stallings, one of the reasons why Stallings, in fact, worked in the system in which he did is that in the advent of sound cinema in the late 20s, Hollywood went to New York and bought virtually every Tin Pan Alley publishing company in existence because they thought, for fairly obvious reasons, it would be stupid to pay them money for the use of their music. They bought it out from under them. One of the reasons why Stallings worked in the manner he marvelously did was it was incumbent upon him through his contract to use as much and as many examples of the Warner Brothers song catalog in his work. And, and if you look back at the things he used, the vast majority, other than the PD things he often uses, is stuff either owned by Warner Brothers or stuff that they bought for the purposes of doing the cartoons, like the Randall Scott themes that often show up. So it was a way also of recycling ownership. Um, when I wrote the article that was alluded to before, in 19, uh, it was published traditionally in 1994, it seemed at that point, I think, that you know, it was still possible on some level you know, sort of culturally otherwise, to talk about sampling as some kind of guerrilla tactic and that there was some kind of, um, you know, vanguard sensibility one could use it to illustrate. And I think for all the reasons that we've seen illustrated today, both by case law and the daily practices of the legal profession discussed this morning, you know, it's extremely difficult to do that anymore. Um, what I've become infinitely more interested in on occasion have written about is, I think now it, it, it's, to me, a more interesting and important to look at what the practice of sampling as a, and, and, and reappropriation of sound as a compositional practice allows us to do and what we might say and think about those objects. And one of the examples I want to pursue for a moment is the fact that if the very practice of sampling and of recontextualized sound allows us to take something that existed in a moment in time and introduce it into another moment of time to be intentionally redundant, what does that say about time? 
And what does that say about history? And what does that say about the relationship between the present moment, the past, the original creator, the present recreator, and the present audience? Just to point quickly as an example, um, the ubiquitous use of the first track on Moby's CD play, which incorporated Alan Lomax's um, use of samples of field recordings done in various parts of the American South in the late 50s. I don't know that I was the only one that found something peculiar and fascinating in the use, among other commercial um, uh, avenues, of that material in um, the advertising that incor incorporated Tiger Woods. If you think of that ad, wasn't it just striking to see a black man playing golf unimpeded through sections of New York City, unstopped by anyone, and in the background having the music which Moby, at the point of the original release of the CD, had appropriated without there in fact being very, cl very definitive clearances between him and Lomax, nor were at that point in time um, a clear clearance relationship and copyright relationship between the Lomax estate and the original subjects of those field recordings. Many of you may know that that has changed, in fact, and there was a recent front page New York Times story about Anna Cheritakis, his daughter and the woman now in charge of the estate, in the, being in the process of tracking down and remunerating, uh, much of it being from the money from the, the Moby recordings, those original agents. But I raise this illustration and I raise this larger question that I think much of, much of the writing on sampling has either been to denigrate it as something which abridges law or to celebrate it as something which is a vanguard enterprise. What I think we also need to do is look at individual acts of composition using it and see what we might say about them and what they might tell us. Um, in an essay which I've written on, it's a, a piece in a group that's, that was mentioned earlier several times today, Negative Land, and their composition U2, what I am in, was intrigued by there is to see above and beyond the sort of snarky joy of their dicking around with this music is what, what, what occurred as a result of that. You know, what did they do by doing that? And one of the ways I found about talking about it is, um, for those of you who know, the larger system in which they operate, which is this notion of, called culture jamming. The basic principle being that under which they operate that if we as individuals exist in a society with very little control over that which is jammed into our consciousness, it is incumbent upon us in whatever way we find possible to take that, that, set, of, um, that set of signals going toward us and re-trigger it back toward the senders and do something to it in the process. That again, we make that unidirectional relationship of consumer to producer and direct a multi-directional, change into a multi-directional system. And when they did that, both with the U2 track and the sample of um, Casey Kasem, the way in which in the essay I talked about it is if we exist in a state of cognitive dissonance virtually all the time, of being bombarded by this information and bombarded by sound, that what culture jamming and the practices of Negative Land and a number of other people allow us to do is engage in the cognition of dissonance that we can come to some understanding and some way of making sense of and redirecting the barrage which we are incapable, it seems, of, un of, of moving outside of. Um, and in that context, just to throw out at you with examples, I don't have videos or, or uh, my computer to put up, um, there, I, as much as I keep track of this stuff, there is just such a massive amount of numbers of individuals and groups who have followed along the lines of doing this kind of work. Um, on the table outside, there was information on the uh, Detritus Group and their website, which is a fascinating resource for connecting to people who operate under this system. Um, also, it just happened, I got it in the mail this week, the April uh, 2002 issue of Wire, which is a fine English music magazine, has an article which they refer to on the cover as bootlegs and plagia rhythms. And it is a really excellent article, self-titled Criminal Elements, of groups that operate as a compositional practice using the abridgment of copyright and the use of found material um, from the sonic barrage. And uh, people who do this both within the commercial system and those people who have worked completely under the table outside of the commercial system entirely. Uh, and it, I mean, I basically spent a good part of one day this week downloading information off the web on a number of groups I, I hadn't heard of before. Um, it seems to me as well that 
beside lauding and being intrigued and entranced, and Lord knows I'm one of many here who is, about what this technology allows us to do, um, I am increasingly more and more interested in wanting to talk to and learn and learn from and find out about how people who use it operate. How are the decisions that they make? When one goes digging in the crates, what is one in fact doing? What is generating those decisions? One is what is generating the desire to include this sound but not that. In that context, I refer you, unfortunately, it, you won't be able to read it yet, a uh, young guy who just finished his PhD in ethnomusicology at the University of Washington is a friend of mine, Joe Schloss, who's done a marvelous ethnographic study of DJs. And what partly he was intrigued in looking at is what he referred to as the ethics of their decision making. You know, what sounds they judge to be appropriate, what sounds are inappropriate why digging itself is an ethically driven activity for a DJ. Um, and it's, it's, it's both an inquiry and a set of questions that prior to Joe's work, I've not seen terribly many people uh, uh, um, pursuing. Um, to make you feel a little better, Joe is in fact working on it as a book, so it should be out soon, but it's a really excellent piece of work. Um, you know, so by contrast to me, I'm intrigued by, as I was trying to point out, you know, what occurred in the process of work like Negative Land's activity. Or another interesting project, which you can find out about the Ramori site, which was um, something known as the Drop Lift Project, which they refer to as being the opposite of shoplifting. What they basically did was it was a sampled found sound document, which they basically dropped into the slots of you know, various record stores and just that people could find it. Um, this had analogies to a group that some of you may have heard of called the Barbie Liberation Front that took toys and reconfigured their uh, v verbal programming and then put them back in the boxes, stuck them on shelves so that people would buy toy soldiers and when they pulled the string in the back expecting somebody to say, you know, kill, motherfucker, kill. Instead it said, you know, make love, not war or things of that sort. You know, these interesting guerrilla, un you know, guerrilla ways of re-articulating meaning. Um, I point to the two films you might want to look at, one of which I think is more striking in that the very nature of the filmmaking itself parallels the activity it's talking about, which is Craig Baldwin's film, Sonic Outlaws, which talks about negative land and various other people working in this area. Baldwin's own work comes out of a collage found film tradition, so the very construction and activity of the film itself mirrors its subject. There's an equally fine, though it, it doesn't work as well in that mirroring of subject to form, film that just came out called Scratch was about DJs, which does really quite excellent historical contextualizing of the practice and just marvelous sequence of, of just watching people doing their, their work and talking about their aesthetic. Um, it might be my literary training showing, but you know, what I'm more and more interested in is hearing people talk about what is this aesthetic. You know, all of us are here uh, interested in defending it and wanting it to be you know, engaged in and not prosecuted, but I think we also need to ask questions of form and value of it. You know, what is it doing, how, to what end, and how successfully? Some more interesting than others. Um, some negative land recordings I find kind of tedious and silly. Some I find quite good. Um, last of all, I want to refer to something which is, uh, especially with lawyers being here, it's, it's more of a kind of a gambit and something I've pursued but not published as a, um, a piece of thinking. But it was something that really struck me um, when I first read it. And this is the two life crew decision and case and Souter's uh, commentary. There was something, it seemed to me, incumbent in what Souter said. Now, of course, ob obviously, without getting into all of the distinctions here, Souter was giving a defense of an act of what he perceived of as parody. And, and I think we've discussed some elements of that this morning that people may understand what, what is special about that art artistic activity. But what I was intrigued by, what seemed to be incumbent in Souter's decision, is that by giving latitude to what he called transformative works and the role of parody, it seemed that there might be worth investigating that incumbent in that decision was a sense of, of, of giving some support to the fact that one can be the owner of an entity, of a piece of intellectual property, but one is not the owner of its meaning in the sense that one cannot argue that that property has a unitary and single meaning. If in fact one of the qualities of a transformative work like parody is to say that any artifact has in fact a, a number of possible meanings. One of which is the meaning which the parodist is alluding to by virtue of creating that parody. 
I think also one of the things that may have struck Souter and potentially may have, may have driven his decision, which um, the public is less, less, has less as access to, I just you know, pursued the legal firm that in fact did it, was the, um, the brief which was provided by the, uh, by the, the other side in the case, the Acuff Rose um, music, music Publishing Company. And the fact that there was a number of statements in their brief which are, were sort of dubious and interesting. Um, one of which was just to quote two, because they're kind of linked together. And again, they go back to what I, I hope is one of the central points I'm trying to make, which is my desire to locate a number of the things we've been speaking of today back to audience, back to reception, and back to the production of meaning. Um, the two statements that were in the Acuff Rose brief were as follows. One made early on is they said, quote, Music has an appeal that transcends differences of culture, language, and class, which I find a fascinating and conceivably quite dubious proposition, that there's some transcendental meaning uh, which element, you know, questions of and the realities of culture, language, and class have no application. They made a somewhat parallel and interesting statement later on in the brief where they said, American popular music knows no ethnic, cultural, class, or other national boundaries. Indeed, one of the great wellsprings in creativity in Amer American popular music is the cross-fertilization of music from different cultures. Now, uh, as they go on to say, to cite the history of jazz and rock and roll as two obvious examples. Now, one could spend quite the better part of a day, if not a whole conference, discussing and debating that proposition, that statement, set of statements. Now, on the one hand, it does allude to what I think is, is an inarguable historical reality, which is that there's been a lack of social permeability in American culture, but quite frequently the presence of cultural permeability. On the other hand, to say that American popular music knows none of those boundaries that referred to is quite questionable. And as I have been pointed out, my time is up. Thank you. We're going to have about um, 10 or 15 minutes of questions, then we're going to go to uh, reception, at which I hope you'll join us. Um, but it is my role now to provide you with um, a boast, uh, a peach piece of uh, useful information that will save you money, uh, and perhaps two thoughts to uh, get us started on the discussion afterwards. The boast and, uh, is that um, I really hope that you continue your exposure to Duke's intellectual property program here by looking at our materials in our recent conference on the public domain. Um, in particular, those of you who are interested in uh, appropriation and sampling might want to look at the panel discussion with Mark Hostler of Negative Land. Mm. And if you go 20 minutes into the real video stream, uh, exactly 20 minutes into the real video stream of that panel, which had Carrie Sherman of the Recording Industry of America and David Nimmer and uh, uh, Mark Hostler, which in itself was just wonderful to see <laughs> all together. If you go into that, you will see um, Negative Land's most recent movie, which is called Gimme the Mermaid, a dubbed version of The Little Mermaid, uh, who is reading aloud a threatening letter from a copyright lawyer to, um, a, uh, to a, a hapless uh, musician, uh, uh, all beautifully animated. Uh, in the actual Disney studios between four and six in the morning by a Negative Land fan. The lawyers in the room were covering their heads as the successive legal violations mounted up during this performance. Um, the useful, I'll come back to that one in a moment. The useful piece of information is that um, uh, DJ Spooky is playing tonight at Cat's Cradle. Uh, it says 8 p.m. I don't know when he goes on. Midnight. Uh, midnight, okay. Uh, see. By the way, can you guys all pass my records back up? <laughs> ah. I hope you did understand the <laughs> irony <laughs> implicit <laughs> in that demand. Um, Information wants to be free. Free, uh, right, right. Going on. We have at least some of them, I think. Um, doesn't one of them I noticed <laughs> appeared to have come from a library and the other one from a uh, record station. Anyway, um, a piece of information is that um, Duke students, at least, who come before uh, 10 p.m. get in for only $8. So I was asked to pass this on. Um, so uh, th that was the, the boast and the useful piece of information. Um, this leads into the question. I was on a panel with Mark Hostler, and um, a very nice uh, academic who was on the panel with him looked after he gave his presentation in which he talked about the moral imperative of appropriation. Uh, the need to transgress, the need to violate the boundaries of corporate culture. Um, and she looked at him and she said, you look like such a nice boy. Why don't you make your own music? Um, 
And he repeated his remarks louder and now more impassionately. Don't you understand corporate culture given to us, covered by fragments of intellectual property? We must transgress. It is indeed. Artists work in the world. This is our world. She looked at him again. She smiled. She said, maybe with guitars? Um, I've seen him play guitar. And the thing that I think this uh, comment brings up not trivially, and I suspect there are at least some people in the audience who are thinking this, is to w we've heard a great deal and listened to a great deal about the delights of sampling, a practice with which I personally, uh, which I personally find deeply attractive. And uh, two questions come to me that neither panel, neither three questions come to me that neither panel has yet resolved. The first is the question of what we should do do we end up with some simplified copyright rule that says less than five seconds is okay, or it's okay if it's not the heart of the work, or if it's okay if it's not one of James Brown's great hooks, or right? I mean, what do we need a rule that could be understand and mechanically applied? Because that's what the citizen creators of culture need, as opposed to the corporate creators of culture, or simply to artists who are well represented by lawyers. So what kinds of rules do we need? Do we need to draw a line? Do we need to go to where negative land says we need to go, where everything except absolutely total appropriation is OK? Do we want to stop short of that? Do we want a nice open test? Do we want one that's mechanically applicable? I, I think those questions remain, um, they've been more fully fleshed out uh, by our discussions today. I don't think they've been answered. The second question goes the other way. Let me play the role of devil's advocate for a moment. We've been talking a lot and we've been glorifying, I think, perhaps rightly glorifying, sampling and appropriation art. Two questions. The first is, does appropriationist art risk becoming as sterile as high modernism in that it becomes simply the working out of a theory about what art needs to be? a kind of postmodernist theory that says, since there's no originality, since all we can have is ironic conformity, we must, therefore, the theory tells us, grab, juxtapose, undermine, coalesce. It's not my own view, but I think it's a, a point that's worth considering. The second point goes the other way. To the extent that appropriationist art depends for much of its power on its notion of transgression, are we doing appropriation art a favor by making it illegal? Would some of the legal reforms that have been discussed here be the equivalent of telling the people who want to chain themselves to the railings, go ahead, feel free, we'll give you padlocks? Would it be the equivalent of telling the people who want to sit in, yes, absolutely, would you like chairs? Would it, in other words, actually undermine the art form at the moment of legitimizing it? So I offer that for sort of general reflection. But now we're going to turn to uh, questions from the audience, please. David. Possible if we could develop watermarking technology to the extent that it couldn't be stripped off of digital. Um, good ladder, David. Sorry, we're not. The mic is not picking you up. If, if we could develop watermarking technology so it couldn't be stripped from digital files, to what extent would that cop, would that make sampling more like quotation marks in literature works, and therefore fall into the aegis of fair use? There's there's efforts to do that. Um, the <laughs> international consortium, uh, it's CSAC. But it's not the American CSEC, it's uh, Confédération Internationale. This, I'm showing my shitty French here. <laughs> Société d'Auteurs et Compositeurs. They have been engaged in, I, it, it's, it's one of these processes where it's not gotten as far as they would wish, but they're doing it in creating, in creating, in coding for compositions. That would be at least some manner of technological analogy to that. Um, can I also respond to that? I truly think that there, you know, most of the watermarking systems are proved obsolete within, you know, seconds. I mean, you can easily just take a digital signal, run it through your old stereo, and then run the cable from your stereo back to, you know, the next recording device you, you so choose. Um, and so to kind of put a reality quotient on it, it's like, you know, trying to say who owns the words you use. Um, you know, it's, you have to really look at it as a kind of a, a, an open source system. That's my take on it. But... At the same time as I'm an artist working in an environment um, that's conditioned and created basically by you know for a, co a corporate structure, you have to kind of have some mechanism to recoup things. I mean, there is uh, there's a band called Marillion, which is um, they released the only their albums strictly on the internet, and um, they even get their fans to go to their website and choose which songs they want to have on the album, for example, and they get thousands and thousands and thousands of hits, and they actually sell a lot of records. Um, they use the, the web as a reverse engineering tool, a social engineering tool, to actually create 
uh, social context, and, and by doing the context, they create the content. Um, I, do, I don't think the watermark technologies will work. It's just not going to happen. But that's, again, it's um, just from what I've seen in, in working with a lot of different software and a lot of different people using the technology, um, it's, it's always an easy, very simple way to bypass things. Okay. Someone else? Yes. Um, th this has been kind of touching on what uh, Dick was talking about, but um, I, I think that we can't ignore the, the economic uh, it seems to me that all these problems come along with cap capitalist enterprise and that it, it does end up being about money. And I'm thinking of like an electronica um, music um, just in the you know, 12 or so years that of, I have experienced it. I'm no expert, but it seems like there was a real transition from like white labels or uh, records being put out, let's say like Chemical Brothers putting out records under a lot, lots of different monikers. And then when they get that taken up by the music industry, you need to have like an assignable author. So now the Chemical Brothers become the Chemical Brothers, and they put out these certain things. Um, and then is when you get into the issues of, of copyright. And it seems to me that the basis of it all is who gets, who's going to make the money, or, or it, it does it does end up being a completely practical thing as opposed to a moral question. And he's, you know, you brought up the the issue that these are human beings and to some extent you know ideally we want copyright law to protect um, the art the small artists but you need money to go to court um, so what you know I think that there's I, I don't know maybe maybe I'm being naive but it seems like in order to have any discussion of what can be done with copyright law you have to think of the of <laughs> who has the money um, what are what are what are the laws actually used for, if it's not these I idealistic ends of protecting the artists or uh, protecting a work of art? And because I, I, I do think it just comes down to money in the end, how it, they're used in practice. Yeah, they, I mean the companies can get legislation to get Disney um, extensions for everything they possibly want. You know, it's like uh, you know it's a boutique. You know, Congress is basically. Um, you know, that's even this new uh, Bush p uh, political campaign money stuff, you know, they just signed the, the law, you know, that's not, you know, the soft money and the ability to manipulate the electoral process, as we've seen in the last couple, you know, elections, that um, the ability to kind of make the system bend to the will of large-scale companies is always going to be part of that process at this point. I, I, but that's where you get this idea of... Um, Again, I, I kind of look at the route of folk culture. I mean, and that's why I like the way Tim was talking about people working things out of court, you know, making specific agreements to try and figure out very utilitarian and pragmatic oriented goals. Um, if, hey, you sample my stuff, you, I, I, I've sampled a lot of stuff, but I usually change it enough that I've, I've never been sued. Um, I, have <laughs> I have friends that have, and they, you know, they, they call the person back, and it's usually been on a one to one kind of thing, and they say, hey, why don't we trade? I'll do a remix of some of your stuff, or we'll just work it out or something, because the more cooks in the kitchen, the more confusion there is. But on a larger multinational scale, if you go to Ukraine, for example, that's one of the biggest uh, software bootleg countries in the world. And, um, you know, the U.S. even threatened trade sanctions that's gone up to all this sort of extreme uh, rhetoric, but it still just keeps happening, you know. Um, it's entropic at this point. That's, but that's Fred? my take. Yeah, I... I Take your point. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you picked up on what I said. For every appropriator, there is an appropriatee who is a human being who is losing out somehow in it, and there's got to be a way to take care of that. But I also think that it's very important that we not oversimplify this question. And I think a lot of well, some of the things that are said today tend to be oversimplifications. As you gathered from my remarks, I'm no great fan of the record companies. The record companies say, and there is some truth to what they say that, well, we have to have this financial arrangement because we put out X number of records a year, and the overwhelming majority of them fail and we lose a huge amount of money on them. This is the only way we can recoup enough money to keep putting out the sufficient quantity of records that gets people out there and lets the public choose. 
You can buy that, you can not buy that, or you can buy that in part. But look deeper. Look deeper at that question. Why does it cost the record company so much money on the, quote, failed, close quote, recording? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons is because they have to pay a god-awful fortune of money to, I'm not sure what you want to call them, I would call them payola agents, because they can't pay radio stations to play their records, which is a main source of promotion of the records. They can't pay the radio station. The law doesn't allow that. So what happens? There's an intermediary. The record company gives X zillion dollars to the intermediary, and the intermediary does something magical, and all of a sudden the radio stations are playing the records. Well, you know, that tends to go to why the record companies are losing so much money that they have to recoup it. Now look even further. Look even further. Let's keep talking in this, in this arena. Because of the change in the communications law, has nothing to do with copyright, has nothing to do with music as such, it used to be that one corporation could own a maximum of right. seven radio stations right. in the country. That was back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. There is no limit now. Yeah. Clear Channel, for example, owns something like 900 radio stations. Yeah. And to eliminate, to lower their costs, they all program the same music. So you hear the same thing no matter where you are, and all the outlets that used to exist for, for new music go by the boards. And on top of that, Clear Channel says, we're not going to perform your music record company and performing artist unless you sign up with our concert promoter subsidiary so you let them promote your concerts. What I'm suggesting, as I suggested when you look at the contracts that exist, is this is way, way complex. And you've got to look much deeper at all the economic relationships some of which are great and some of which are reprehensible before you can get an an begin, begin to get an answer to the question that you asked. Let me pick up quickly on, on that point because I think this is something I, I, I always try to bring into meetings like this. If any of you are unfamiliar with the terms of what the Communications Act did of 96, am I giving it the right year? You know, I, let me just say a show of hands. How many people know what were the terms of the 1996 Communications Act? <laughs> the major Enough ones. of them. I mean, that act changed our lives yeah. Yeah. enormously. I mean, just an, on, and in some terms cataclysmically. And and the amount or lack of publicity, and in part the lack of publicity because of interlocking ownership issues um, that permitted it and permitted most people not to know about it is something we need to pay attention to. You know, pay attention to FCC decisions. You know, realize that that Michael Powell is going to play a major role, quite likely in many of our lives, all of our lives, for more than a few years, and possibly in places other than the FCC, um, to, to, un, to mitigate and, and possibly help solve one sense of feeling just purely steamrolled by this, you know, look towards organizations that are engaged in activities of media activism. And I suggest in that context, the uh, scholarship of Bob McChesney, Robert McChesney, is extremely useful and extremely smart on both his history of the 1934 Communications Act, which Oxford University Press published several years ago, a more recent book whose title I'm, I'm forgetting, but came out from University of Illinois Press. I mean, he's a very smart guy. It's well-detailed work, and it will, it will enlarge everything that was just said in a historical and an economic context. Thanks. Well, I think we need to close. I, I'm going to seize the podium to make, say one final optimistic thing, which is I take it one of the points that in your question about their impact of money was not simply the impact of money in terms of who can make the system work for them, but who makes the rules. And one thing that I would like to say, and that's actually behind us putting on this conference and the activities we engage here at Duke, is I'm actually marginally more optimistic about the future because it used to be that copyright rules and telecom rules were things that were largely rules about, they were basically contracts between various industries, which were brokered by the industry representatives, and then the Congress just enacted them into law. And you know, you had the librarians occasionally said, the public interest, and then they sat down again. But that was basically, you know, the, the sort of deal. It was it was a there were there was a, a large amount of horse trading. And to be honest, there were some of the things that came out of that weren't so bad, but at the moment when it was very hard to violate a copyright. When it was because you didn't have your own printing press, because when it was very hard to violate a copyright, when the law didn't granularly affect you on an individual level, that system, although it had great flaws, was not as bad. I actually think that the flip side of everything we've been talking about today, 
which is that copyright law is something that you can violate quite easily even by accident while doing the kinds of things which Scott and Anthony demonstrated for us this morning. The flip side of that is that you now have a new generation of people who talk about this. I mean, the idea that you could have got a whole lot of people who weren't lawyers to be in here and talking and actually knowing what the DMCA is or kind of laughing when the little DCSS thing came up or knew that the Supreme Court just took cert in Eldred versus Ashcroft 10 years ago would have been ludicrous. So I actually think we're in the middle of a, a sort of a beginning of a sort of popular focus on that. And that's what necessary if the, uh, the uh, laws don't continue to be made purely for the interests of a very narrow uh, group of people involved. So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists and also Daphne Keller. And we are going to adjourn to a reception in the Birdman Lounge. The Birdman Lounge. Thank, thank you all. Okay. It's important for me to make a plug, which is uh, this morning people were talking, someone was talking, uh, David, the other uh, chair, about the traveling circuses of conferences. But I've been a long-term member of a group which studies popular music from a vast number of viewpoints called the International Association for the Study of Popular Music. We have a journal. We have conferences. I have membership forms. You know, one must hawk one's wares. And uh, <laughs> if you're interested in pursuing a number of these questions, it's an excellent avenue to do so. Please come get one. And one of the other things I wanted to do was to, uh, to have give Wendy Seltzer a chance to talk about the Chilling Effect project, which I didn't manage. But uh, let us, uh, we can talk a little bit about that during the reception. I'd also uh, refer you to their website, Chilling Effects, on the web. You can find it easily through Google. Thank you. And, and, and